please join me in a warm welcome for Monica Holloway, best-selling author. First of all, I want to say thanks to all of you for what you do here. I, I read everything on the website, but I wasn't prepared for what I saw when I came here today. And I just, um, as a parent of a child with autism and a child who also rides horses in L.A., and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm teared up just <laughs> thinking that you worked all day and volunteered and, and that you showed up tonight. It means a lot to me, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, I prepared something to say to you guys, and then um, I think what I'll do is I'll take questions, and then I'll just talk to you about sort of how Wills is doing, and I'll talk uh, more about the horse aspect of of him dealing with horses if you'd like, or whatever you'd like to talk about, but um, I'm going to hit on mostly uh, some stuff in the book, and um, I just want to say, Maggie, thank you for the tour. It was really wonderful, and um, it's, it, it sh I mean, looking around is one thing, but hearing the story and the history of the Shea Center and what it was to begin with, and then, you know, over 200 volunteers now, which is mind-boggling um, and overwhelming to a parent um, who has a child who is not always accepted, um, and to know that not only do you accept him and children like him and adults like him and anybody with a disability, I, it seems, um, but that um, this is a place where he finds a lot of love and acceptance and um, means the world to us as parents. So let me, um, can you guys see me if I, can everybody see me if I sit on this chair, if I, if I perch on this chair? I'm going to use some paper because I, I did want to write something for you and not just, you know, because all right, because I read how great you are. Um, I just the other thing I want to say, and I asked Maggie this, is just I hope that all of you understand the sense of joy and accomplishment that you give every single day, no matter how hot the day is, or how tired you must be, or what other jobs you have. Um, my son, when he gets home from riding horses, is a different child, and um, and I'll talk about that. I said, my son. I'm, cho I'm, I'm choked up by you. Okay. <laughs> My son Wills is fortunate enough to work with horses at the Children's Ranch in Los Angeles because the Shea Center is way too far for us to drive every week. So I would be here as well, I can tell you. And on ranch days, I can relax knowing how happy he is to be there. From my seat on the sidelines, I see a smile stretched across his face as he circles the riding ring, his brown and black helmet ever so slightly bobbing with each hooved step. The ranch is where Wills fell in love with horses. And just like here at the Shea Center, it's where my autistic son discovered the love, responsibility, and respect that comes from working closely with animals. A place where so many people, just like you, take a child who feels awkward or unsure of themselves in the world and makes them feel at home and completely welcomed. Yes, my son has learned to balance on a horse, which is amazing. But he also talks to the other riders now, casually, without anxiety. And somehow when he's riding, his social worries completely disappear for him. and He's more confident and able to reach out to his peers. He can saddle and groom a horse, muck a stall, feed the rabbits, ducks, guinea pigs, and kittens himself. But more importantly, he trusts. He trusts his horse, Honey, the ranch's horse, but it's his horse if you ask him, and Honey trust him. At the ranch, he learns without knowing he's even being taught. That's the miracle that you give, and that's the miracle that he gets once a week, Wednesday nights. The other riders have become people, children that Wills respects and admires. He watches them to assess not only where he's going, but where he's been. Because there are children there that struggle more than Wills, either physically or emotionally. But there are those that struggle less. Like any rich and rewarding community, those attributes shift and are in constant flux. One week, Wills is a leader, and the next, he's working hard to catch up. Smart, talented, and intuitive therapists, horse experts, and volunteers allow this fluctuating dynamic to exist, all the while keeping the writers confident, calm, and secure. There's no hurdle too high enough and no such thing as too disabled. Everyone is welcome, as I said before, and I can see that everyone is welcome here. 
Animals are undeniably the best healers when paired with people who understand how and why that is so. You know this better than anyone. And you have to know that mothers like me are eternally grateful. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And thank you for having me here. It means a great deal. Now to the book. Besides being a mom, I'm an author and um, an autism advocate. <coughs> So many incredible families and friends have come into my life since I published this book, Cowboy and Wills, last year. It's the story of my son, and you saw his, remar his remarkable dog, Cowboy. When Wills was six years old and struggling with his autism in a mainstream school, we bought him a golden retriever puppy to soften the difficult transition, but she ended up changing everything for Wills, ultimately being the best gift that any of us had ever received. When Wills was diagnosed with autism at age three, my husband and I felt extremely alone. Sure, Wills had a terrific therapist, Catherine, who he had been seeing since he was 18 months old, but in every other way, we felt completely isolated. After all, my husband Michael's family lived in New Jersey, 3,000 miles away, and my family, with the exception of my sister, were unsupportive. What our son needed was a let's surround Wills with smarts and experience family. So we got busy. We relied on Catherine and also found other therapists and educators who knew more than we did about narrating Wills' feelings for him so he wouldn't be standing alone in the world. We learned how much Wills needed repetition and structure in his life, so we began putting up scheduling boards and giant calendars on our family room wall. If there were changes in our schedule, we let Wills know as soon as possible, trying not to surprise him if we could help it. But in my heart, I knew we needed more. We needed animals. <laughs> the day I got Wilson's diagnosis, the two of us bought a 10-gallon fish aquarium. 10-gallon fish aquarium. <laughs> if he had a terrible day at preschool, and he often did, we swung by Petco for a pick-me-up, usually a hermit crab, because they were small, colorfully painted, and cheap. <laughs> but we also bought, as you saw from the video, dumpy frogs, turtles, hamsters, rats, I filled our house with scaly and furry creatures that were more dependent, but less scared than I was. And Wills, he loved every one of them. He spent hours thinking of clever names like Booner Schooner for the hamster, <laughs> or Red Rat Dirt, the rat, and creating tiny homes out of cardboard boxes and plastic tubes. With Wills struggling to make it in his new kindergarten, I needed something huge to extend our menagerie and to fortify my belief in all things good. Something strong like a lion. But sadly, Sherman Oaks, California is not zoned for lions, so we bought Will something just as hairy but twice as nice. And you saw her there, Cowboy. Cowboy Carol Lawrence, to be precise. <laughs> and Will's is nothing if not precise, especially when it came to naming his new puppy. So we clung to our adorable brown eyed pup and tried to figure out how to help Will's. We bought books on golden retrievers and subscribed to Dog Fancy Magazine. And because of Cowboy, we actually had some good news. Great news, in fact. For the first time ever, thanks to his new dog, Wills was sleeping in his own bed without the night terrors that had plagued him his entire life. He and Cowboy slept through the night, arm in paw. And Wills, oh, how he hated baths. He didn't like the feel of water or bubbles against his skin due to the sensory integration problems. But one afternoon, as he was suffering through yet another bath, Cowboy burst through the bathroom door like Clint Eastwood in High Plains Drifter <laughs> and dove into the bathroom with it. I swear to God, it was going to be chaos and screaming and tears and mass hysteria. But to my amazement and my absolute joy, Wills was laughing. With Cowboy in there, he began to giggle and splash around, and he finally asked, can I shampoo her? <laughs> Bubbles, I thought. Well, I quickly grabbed a bottle of Johnson's baby shampoo and handed it to Wills. <laughs> 30 minutes later, I took out one soggy dog and one hairy but happy kid. <laughs> the bath problem, as I spit, forever solved. I guess I'm thinking about bath and wet. Cowboy was more than earning her keep. Wills was petrified of crowds, restaurants, public restrooms, birthday parties, and playground time at school, but we were working on it. And whenever Cowboy was there, everything was better. The only problem was, Cowboy was getting sick. 
For such a young dog, she wasn't acting very peppy or wild. Six months after we got her, she was diagnosed with canine lupus, which I had never heard of, and this made her ineligible to be trained as a service dog. Well, having a service dog would have helped Wills immensely, as you all know, especially at school or inside public places, because a new major goal of his therapy was to not keep him isolated. He needed to be out in the world. For that to happen, we needed Cowboy to be there. So we managed to sneak her into a few bookstores and well, a pizza joint throughout, <laughs> restaurants throughout the San Fernando Valley that'll remain nameless, but uh, <laughs> she was there. But Wills also needed Cowboy at home, and this was a miracle to me. He would go into his bedroom and sit on the floor and bury his face in her ears, confiding in her all his hopes and fears, which he could not do with another person, even his mom or dad. And whenever they'd emerge from his room, Wills would say something like, Oh, Cowboy's sad today. Or Cowboy got her feelings hurt. And for the first time in my life with my son, I knew exactly how he was feeling. He was finding a way to express himself. And as I said on the video, when we were driving home from therapy one afternoon, from the back seat, we were stuck in traffic. And he wanted a bottle of water, and I didn't have any water. And I said, Wills, we just have about six more minutes, and I always carried water in the car. I was cursing myself for being a lousy mother that I was <laughs> sitting there going, my son's so thirsty. And he just had water at preschool. Um, and he said, there's a stomach-wide water shortage back here. <laughs> I was like, oh. So the writer in me writes it down. That's a pretty good one. That's a good one. I like that. I hadn't thought about writing a book with, about him yet. Um, and then the, I rolled down all the windows so the air was blowing on him and his bangs were straight up and blowing back. And I heard him say, oh, I love you, cowboy. I love you. And he'd never said, I love you, even to me, even though he showed it, God knows. He never said it to any, anyone, anybody. It was quite the moment. His therapist, his smart and encouraging teachers, Cowboy and his wonderful friends were life-changing for this boy who was such a loner, and we, will, we were deeply grateful for each and every one of them. We had more than one doctor tell us that Wills was not capable of improving, and when we mourned that notion, we were told that we had bigger problems to worry about. But Wills is not a problem, as you all know. Children are not problems to be solved. He's our son and simply needs what every child needs, a loving, generous family, and people who don't believe in the word can't, to be challenged and supported, but never, ever, ever underestimated. With all of the angels in our lives, no entity was more of a practical influence on Wills than Cowboy. She took my son, who now had the tools to enter the world, and nudged him out there to experience it all. She insisted on going trick-or-treating when Wills was too scared chased him into the ocean for the first time, and dragged him by his pant leg through wet mud. And you all know what an autistic child thinks about being clean. <laughs> but mostly she taught him that loving something with your entire heart and soul is a very, very, very good thing. Connecting with another soul is all that really matters in this world, and he knew it. Sadly, Cowboy died two and a half years to the day we picked her up leaving us shocked and Wills flattened. Wills' family and friends gathered around him. He would not be grieving alone. The day after Cowboy died, Wills turned to people for the first time in his entire life. He came outside his school after I had said I would keep him home for the day, and his therapist said he has to go to school. He has to go to school and understand that there will be people there supporting him, and he does not have to stay at home and hide his feelings and grieve alone. So they put a circle together at school, and which was brilliant. And everybody knew Cowboy because she was always knocking the kids down coming in and out of the cave. She was at school a lot, um, and everybody knew her. Um, and I can tell you later well, why he named Cowboy was a girl, why he named her Cowboy, Carol Lawrence. But, um, and they went around the circle and talked about everybody's story about Cowboy. Some of the kids didn't like Cowboy very much because she knocked him down. <laughs> Most of them loved her, and then they all had stories of loss lost a grandparent or a dog or a shirt or you know and I didn't know this was going on I was at home just miserable about sending him to school but when I picked him up for the first time ever he walked across the parking or the, park, the playground and he had three kids hanging on him and 
I was like, is that Will's? Like, I couldn't even, <laughs> and it was him. And he never, ever went back to just being solidly with animals, although he loves his animals. He needed those friends more. And I understood that as being sort of Cowboy's parting gift to Will's. She had taught him that to trust and to love is okay, and that he could actually extend that beyond Cowboy, thank God. Well, he just turned 14. He's huge, he's six feet tall, even though he's six feet tall, 170 pounds. His dad is 6'5", and, um, and a big guy too, and um, you know, I said, We're, God help me, he's a teenager, but uh, I'm starting through menopause, so don't come to our house, because <laughs> I don't want to know what the hormones are doing in Sherman Oaks. <laughs> Stay away. But Wills played his first Little League game last spring, and he hit a grand slam in the second game. This child who could not connect a ball to a bat last January um, and wanted to try out for a Little League. And I was like, oh my God, great, let's do it, let's go. And his dad and I were sweaty. I had the sweat mustache and he was trying out. And he did okay at tryouts, but I thought, oh no, no, he's probably not gonna make a team. Well, he made a team and then he made this incredible group of really, really typical friends um, who really didn't know what autism was, didn't understand it, didn't know what it was. And like halfway through the season, they were, te they were learning how to slide. And so Wills would run up to the plate, lay down, and roll over like a hot dog. <laughs> and they said, can't you just slide? And finally he just goes, don't you know I have autism? <laughs> and, like, and one of the kids said, my mom told me. He goes, well, I have autism. And it's hard for me to get to skin up my knees. I don't like that very much. So they got him the knee pads and all that. So he ran up to the base, he laid down, and he rolled like a hot dog. <laughs> Forget it. Don't slide. Don't worry about it. And we had the, the, the tea party at the end of school. And I was really concerned because, you know, I, I just Wills hadn't been with those kids outside the ballpark. I didn't know them really well personally. And he came out. I mean, this is a big kid. He came out with, um, what do you call it, the floats that go around the, the center of him and his and his... Yeah, what is it? A boppy? No. No, not, not a boppy, but pretty close. Like a ring that you blow up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And his swimming trunks. And he was like, anybody want to swim? And I was like, just, my, his dad and I were like, oh, no. Because these are kind of jock kids. And they're like, dog pile on wheels. And everybody, I was like, no. And they just jumped on him and everybody in the pool. And it was fine. They were fine with him. And it's me who needs to learn now, um, you know, that he can handle this and let go a little bit. Um, and he went to the All-Star Game with his dad um, this past spring with 50,000 screaming fans, and he was uh, one of them. <laughs> and I really think I have Cowboy to thank for starting all of this. I mean, I only, in my heart, I don't believe a person could have done this for him. That's just his story, but, and it's how it went. But um, anyway, um, as I said in the beginning, Wills is riding horses now, and um, he's been asked to be a team trainer, which it means that he takes care of the little kids six and under. And he's really proud, as he should be. And I brought a little picture of what he looks like today. Um, that's him at the children's ranch with his helmet on. Um, and here's something that this, <coughs> excuse me, happened like two weeks ago, about a week and a half ago. <coughs> Wills has recently outgrown the horse, Honey. It happened very fast. I mean, we weren't expecting it. The trainers weren't expecting it to happen so fast. He just kind of had a growth spurt. And um, so now um, they're asking him to ride in the adult ring at the paddock, which is very different than his comforting little tiny children's ranch. And he is unsure of this transition, um, just as he was unsure of coming to the children's ranch. This is a new and bigger adventure in a world where he no longer needs to be treated differently due to his autism. This is a typical riding situation, and they feel that he's ready. He's even welcome to compete if he would like. And in fact, his best friend Addie did her first show last Sunday, and um, we all fell apart when she came out in her jacket and her, her velvet helmet with the bow on the back. It was, she did a wonderful job. Um, but still, you know, leaving the children's ranch um, has left us all with a, a very heavy heart. Um, because now my husband and I are facing a new challenge, one that we both welcome and dread. <coughs> we have to let Wills be bigger, to loosen our grip on the boy who needed us so much. At the paddock, he'll be with, like I said, typical teenagers, and that will be both a challenge and a triumph for him. 
He met his new horse last Sunday, Salvador. Um, Sally's white with uh, black freckles. And Maggie, you showed us a horse that looked a little bit like Salvador, the first one we saw on the right. Um, Winnie? Ashton. No. Ashton. 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 Why can I forget Ashton across from the mini? The mini horse's name is? Benny. Benny. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we're going to be out there putting her in the back of our truck right now. Um, so Will's not looking at each other in shock because this horse is huge and uh, until Will's got on the saddle. And then he looked perfectly in proportion. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, my son is large. <laughs> not a baby anymore. And, you know, and I need to, that's good. I, I got to deal with this. So, you know, the therapist, he still had a therapist, his old therapist with him from the children's ranch. Um, and they walked away in the opposite direction of the children's ranch. And in my uh, view, they walked, you know, they're walking into, into the future, which is good. prepared speech. <laughs> I wanted to write you something. My love letter to you for being so wonderful. Um, and I just want to say too that um, I, I, it's really important to me and I wanted to make sure that um, I give each and every one of you a book. There's no books being sold today unless you want a book for a family member or whatever. But, oh my gosh, um, thank you. Guys. No, well thank you too. We are volunteers that have helped our kids and our family and Will's friends and your kids are our kids, are their kids. You know, it's all one world, but I'm happy to sign them for you. And, um, you know, nothing would please me more. I would never make you pay for a book. Just thank you so much. I'm just so grateful that you're here and you're doing what you're doing. So does anybody have any questions for me about anything? Or mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about replacing Cowboy? Oh, boy, has Cowboy been replaced. Not replaced. You can't replace Cowboy. In fact... I mean, getting another golden. We did. We have well, we have two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even ask how many animals we have, but we yeah, we have two. But one was a drive-by dogging, but the other one. <laughs> at the end of the book, my first thing when was when I found out Cowboy was really in fact dying was we're buying a dog right now. And his therapist said you have to let him grieve. You have to let him have this loss. And I was like, I can't have it myself. You know, I'm right. sweaty again. I sweat because I'm sweaty a lot. <laughs> uh, so this is Buddy that we get at the end of the book. She's now 91 pounds. Oh, wow. And she's five years old. Oh, five years old on the 21st of October because we're having a little doggy party. So <laughs> October 21st. So he's got Buddy. And then, like I said, we dropped by the, um, when Buddy was three, we dropped by the um, uh, breeder to show her how big Buddy had gotten, how beautiful Buddy was. And she said, wow, it just so happens that this is the day all the puppies get picked up. Wow. Said, oh, that's so nice, because they're usually all spoken for. And she said, yes, one family came, and I found out that they live in an apartment, so they can't take the dog. I won't let them have him. I was like, whoa. <laughs> I look at Wills, and Wills looks at me, and I'm like, Daddy's gonna say no, you know, because he's the he's the voice of reason. And this little pudgy, beautiful boy comes running out and goes right to Will's, and his dad said, "We'll take him." Before <laughs> anyone said anything, so now that's Leo Henry. Is now. <laughs> so we have Buddy Rose, who, he, who Will's calls Rosie, and then uh, Leo Henry, who he calls Hank. <laughs> so that's a yeah. So and Car Cowboy Carol Lawrence came about because. Um, he, we had this whole thing about naming his new puppy. So when he was struggling in the fall, we had to wait for puppies to be born, and we were putting it off till Christmas. Like, you know, um, you're going to get a puppy, and we're going to get it at Christmas time. So we, he wanted Sparky, and he had all these names. And then he came up with Cowboy um, sort of out of the blue. It wasn't a, a specific thing. Um, and then I had mentioned to him that that was a great name, and I love that name. And he had liked Rango was the other thing. Ringo, Ringo, Ringo. And I said, Cowboy's a great name, but she is going to be a girl, and that's fine. But just so you know, people might ask you about, you know, why is Cowboy a girl? And that's fine. And you can just say, because she is, or whatever you want to say. He said, okay. So when we went to get Cowboy the morning that you saw on the um, video, um, the Christmas carols were playing, because it was Christmas time. So he stood there for a second in his pajamas, and he goes, well, let's call her Cowboy Carol, and they'll know she's a girl. Oh. <laughs> so the papers say Cowboy Carol. And then we went to Long's Drugs in Brentwood <laughs> to get medication. And we're standing there, and we're waiting. And it keeps coming on the speaker, 
Um, Mr. Lawrence, please re please come to the uh -huh. car seat. <laughs> and Wills is getting more and more anxious, and I see his his arm starting to flap, and he's worried, and he's like he's starting to do this, and he's like, Mr. Lawrence, they're gonna give Mr. Lawrence his stuff away. <laughs> they will not give Mr. Lawrence his stuff away for sure. They'll keep it for him, but he'll come, he'll make it, you know. And he's like, so all of a sudden, this gentleman walked up, all uh, you know, Paul Newman with a a nice little flannel uh, jacket on, and. Uh, Wills yells at the top of his lungs. He's so quiet in public, but he goes, Mr. Lawrence is here! <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so, so then we're heading home, right? So that passes by. That's really funny to me. So then we get we get in the car. He's sitting in the back. With, he always had Cowboy on his lap, no matter how big Cowboy was. And you know he was very little then. He's this big dog. He's in his car seat or booster. I guess it was car seat still. Uh, only into the booster. And he has window down. And this really funky, rocking bunch of guys come up beside us. I'm like, oh, please don't give me the finger. <laughs> and the guy's like, looks over and goes, hey, what's the name of that dog? And I'm like, oh. So I'm rolling down the passenger window, but Wills goes, cowboy, cowboy Carol Lawrence. <laughs> he goes, all right. <laughs> From then on, that was her name. And everybody thinks Carol Lawrence, the actress, but no, it's cowboy Carol, Christmas Carol. Mr. Lawrence! <laughs> That's the name. So, his other hamster's name was False Alarm. I mean, he just has a <laughs> name. So great alarm. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> so, yeah. What made you decide to write the book? It's interesting. My first book um, is a real upper called Driving with Dead People. <laughs> I actually love that book because I drove a hearse in high school and uh, I looked just like I did, you know, I look much younger than I do now, but I was still kind of like, I had a bow in my hair and I smoked. <laughs> but I had to go from Columbus to Cincinnati to pick up bodies that came in on the airport, you know, because a lot of people die in Florida. They go to Florida vacation and they go. Married my father, who's a jerk, instead. <laughs> so my, the book's a little bit about my jerky father. Yeah. I can say that because uh, he's not here. And uh, but no, uh, the book is really about. Uh, and I won't dwell on the first book, but the book really, Drive with Dead People, is about having people in your brain who say to you when you're little, you know, you're not very bright, or whatever they say that sticks to you, and you're like. They're not here anymore, but like for some reason that one little thing is in there. It's like my ears stick out. Whatever. I'm you know, my mother, I'm like, I need to get rid of these ghosts in my head. And the image that I always had was that I would drive to my hometown, kick the doors open in my car, be like, everybody out, out of my head, out of my car, ghosts out, get back in, 
lock all the doors, peel out of there like a maniac, and leave the ghosts behind. And when I wrote that book, I freaking did leave those ghosts behind. I really did. It was incredibly cathartic for me. Yeah, and the book is humorous. I mean, it's not all dark, but um, there's some, I had a really difficult early childhood. But, um, but uh, we have some fun with it. You said that you had a therapist for Will starting at 18 months. Mm -hmm. What sparked, like, something's yeah. different or something's... I never had um, a, a child, and um, he's my only child. And um, interestingly enough, I was 34 when I had him. So I'm very old. No, I'm just kidding. Um, 49. 49. Oh, just 49. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a birthday last week. It's horrible. Oh, another one. No, I'm good. I'm not going back a year. I'm fine. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any vitamins or something? Geritol. Yeah. Uh, what did you ask me? I what asked you, you what, what sparked. Oh, it? right. So I was an older, not an older mother, but I wasn't a young, young mother, and I was surprised that more of my friends didn't have kids, but they didn't. So I didn't have a lot to go off of, and I didn't, I, I didn't see my parents. I don't see my family. I see one sister and my whole family. So they're driving dead people now. <laughs> and, um, and so there was no really, not anybody to ask, but I felt very early on that something was wrong. And um, he, well, it wasn't like I was um, intuitive. He would scream and cry whenever yeah. I took him out of the house. Exactly. And he was terrified of strangers. And he was a, a very beautiful, as you can see, like, yeah. um, he had this sort of open face that people wanted Probably to touch. Probably attracted attention, yeah. I think all babies do. Uh, but people came out and I'm like, <laughs> no, no, no. So I learned to say, he has a cold. You, I don't want you to catch that cold. I was trying to think of something to say. Um, and he didn't walk until he was almost two years old. You know, but, but then we had him in therapy. But um, mostly it was the stranger anxiety, the screaming and the crying. Um, he would not be able, no one could hold him but me, not even my husband. So um, taking a shower or, you know, I remember I went to Starbucks. I said, my husband's like, you have to go to Starbucks. I was like, I don't want to without the baby. And I couldn't, so I, he was like, so I went to Starbucks, which is literally four minutes from my house, less. And I get I get a text from my husband, come home, come home. I'm like, really? I can't stand in line for Starbucks? That's when we got really scared. He had cried so much. By the time I got there, in that short amount of time, his face was all swollen and vomited. Um, so we knew something was up. Yeah. And then what really sent me to therapy was, uh, just quickly, was um, uh, he was 18 months old. He didn't like surprises, like if the mailman came, he would go hide. Or, um, so a friend called and said, can I drop a book off? And I was like, oh boy, but I really, I was so lonely and I'd been so isolated with Wills. And so I said, sure, just drop, drop the book off and you can meet Wills. And he'd had a really great day and I thought, you know, he's had a good nap, it's gonna be okay. So I, I tell him that she's coming and I see that look in his eyes. I'm like, she's just gonna drop the book off and she's gonna go, you know, but he's 18 months old and I don't know what he's understanding. And he's not talking or babbling. And I went to let her in, and I turned to say, there's Wills, and his blocks were scattered, and he was gone. And I went into his room, where I saw the blocks go around the corner. <laughs> he was in the far back of his closet, behind all of these boxes. I, he must have gotten over them somehow. I could just see the top of that white, blonde hair, and he was rocking. And he had his hands on his ears. And when I saw that, the cold that went through me, I was like, I, I could hardly talk. I'm like, there's something horribly wrong. So I went out, and I told her that he wasn't feeling well, because this was not a friend I knew very well. And I said, um, so can we get together another time? I was saying, so leave, because I'm yeah. having a mental breakdown. Yeah. And I called my husband and said, come home now. And then I called my own therapist. Thank you. Um, who's been great, too. <laughs> I'm going to give her a book. <laughs> she deserves a lion. Um, and uh, she, she told me there's somebody in town in L.A., but she's, she's the best, and she has a waiting list blocks along. I, I called her, and she said, come in, and I'll refer you to somebody. And her real name is um, Jessica. And the book is dedicated to Jessica. But I have to call her Catherine. But I never do when I'm talking to her. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, One of your books just fell over. <laughs> um, and uh, when, I, when we went to see her, you know, Wills was barely walking. And um, he, he was playing on the carpet. He was OK in her office. And then when we went to leave, he stood on his tiptoes and kissed the top of her nose because she was leaning down. She's like, oh, no, I've got to see this kid. <laughs> He's never kissed anyone. You know, It's like he knew there was a connection, and now they're still together. So I told her if she leaves me in adolescence, I'm going to pop it. Oh. 
<laughs> so she's been amazing. So, so she's the one that's that looks like the spectrum. He's too young. I'm not going to diagnose him now, but we'll start getting this team. So we've got language so and everything. Because right he had the same therapist through all everything. She's the team leader. And then he said, you know, OT and speech and language and everything. What's the prospect long term for therapy? I'm sorry, I keep asking questions. That's okay. <laughs> well, um, we just had him tested over the summer for the first time um, in three and a half years, and now he's Asperger's. And um, he's at a school in Pasadena called the Frostig School. Do, do any of you know the Frostig School? <laughs> yeah, we're right back to Frostig. Go team for Pasadena Unified. Thank you, thank you. We love it there. Uh, well, that's where Wills is. Oh, he, he went right. there. He mainstreamed in fifth, or he went from a mainstream school to Frostig in fifth grade. And then he's been there, and now he's in eighth grade, and they're mm -hmm. recommending that he be mainstream next fall. Mm -hmm. So we were like, oh my god. So he's going to New Roads in Santa Monica in the fall, and they have a spectrum program. But he didn't even qualify for the spectrum program, but it's there for him to lean on if he needs it. So it's it's scary, and it's great. It's really exciting. So he's done, he's done well, and I know how lucky we are that he was able to improve. So I know lots of families who worked harder than we did, right? we went by a lot. And the other thing that I want to say that's true, and you guys know, you know, um, I grew up without a lot of money. Well, you don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in Ohio. You know, I drove a hearse, for God's sake. Just like four cigarettes, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so, <laughs> we're all yeah. poor. Yeah. Everybody, 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 everybody in the Midwest, Midwest, Midwest is poor. Midwest? Illinois. Thank we you. Both are. Oh, okay. We both are. All right. Well, I, I mean, we had what we needed, but, you know, yeah. I didn't know I was poor. But I, I also knew I couldn't really buy an album whenever I wanted, but that's fine. Um, but um, when my husband and I got married, we, we had um, we got married and we went to Cape Cod. Who just talked to me about Cape Cod? You just talked to me. <laughs> my own friend Kate just talked to me. About <laughs> and um, and for our honeymoon, and we literally had hundred and twenty dollars to get from Cape Cod back to Los Angeles. Wow. And we're like, what the hell are we doing? And um, what was great about it was we 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 got back, and um, my husband's a television. And he got a job on The Simpsons. Nice. And that was quite the gig. Oh, as Matt Cronick, Northern yeah. Illinois University. Matt, yeah. 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 Oh, that's a good friend. Okay, so so they just got picked up for two more years, but that's it. Mm -hmm. So they're going to make it to 25. But on Friday, we thought it was going to be canceled. Yeah. So it's been kind of fun. But so anyway, I just think it's amazing that whatever the universe is or whatever you believe in, uh, for our family, we're so fortunate that it provided. I mean, we really could not have afforded half of this. And I know people go through families so much to afford therapy for their children, and I just feel, I don't know how grateful I could be to have that. It's in the intention of the family. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. Well, it is now. My name is really Monica Buckley. <gasps> but my father, um, my father uh, committed some crimes when we were little um, against us girls, and um, that's part of driving the dead people. And when I wrote that book, I decided I didn't want his name I didn't want my husband's name either. Because <laughs> like, I didn't know Monica Price. It's fine, but who is that? And so, if you've ever read Drive the Dead People, you'll know I had the. Well, I, somebody said to me one time, you know, you made it out. How did, how did you make it out? And I said, I was loved. I had somebody that really loved me. And that was my granddad, which was my mother's mother. And she saved my life. All of our, the four of us kids were saved by her and her love and generosity. And her maiden name is Holloway. Mm -hmm. So I'm Monica Margaret Holloway instead of Monica Lynn Buckley. <laughs> my mother named me Lynn and then misspelled it every time she wrote to me. She would spell it L I N, L Y N N E. <laughs> so I showed her my birth certificate, literally, and she said, That's wrong. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Changing my name. <laughs> I also felt like I wanted. To tell my story very honestly, and as I am, and I, and if somebody wants to be real, like, friend, like, say they're friends with me or say they're related to me, they they're welcome to, but if they don't, they don't have to, and I think that's fair. And Out I feel more friend. myself as Monica. <laughs> <laughs> what? Out of your friend. <laughs> okay, you can be my friend now, and I won't change my name again. <laughs> Do you have um, like a way to that you communicate with other parents? Um, I have I teach kindergarten also, mm -hmm. and I have a mom right now who's struggling a lot with somebody with her son, 
And like, do you have an email website yes. that I can? The best thing would be to talk to Jess in yes. the class. She's my big time publicist. So she's always like, she's so sweet with her camera and everything, but really, she's pretty important. I'm just <laughs> she is, though. She's amazing. Um, and she will, will make sure, if you get that, the email to her, or you can give her my email, my personal email, um, and I always am happy to talk to you. Okay. And I'll give her my phone number. Now. Yeah, definitely. Because I don't, I, I don't want to leave a video lying out there. And just so you know, and you guys know too, um, that we do. I, Wills and I, we're really big on um, literacy. We're on the, well, Michael and I are on the board of the National Center for Family Literacy, and um, we are dedicated to giving uh, free books to any public or school, any kind of library. So if you guys have any kind of library that you know of, or a town library or a school library, um, I'd love to deliver them if you want a book or need a book. Um, what is Will's into right now? Like, what is he like? Is he? Oh my gosh! Baseball, 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 baseball. Yeah. Everything is baseball, and yeah. you know, statistics and. That's no wonder he's into like what he remembers. Like you're saying, the trains and the parts of it. Boeing seven forty seven. He was really into that airplanes and how they go and fit together. And um, it's interesting because, um, gosh, it's been really recently. I think it was right as school was starting. He was anxious about starting. Grade, knowing that this is the last time he was going to be at Frostig um, for the fall, and he he loves it there. And um, he said, "Can we go get some some train tracks?" And I was like, "Get in the car, <laughs> let's go!" Because he has sort of not done trains for two years, and it was really surprising. And so we, we went into the storage unit and pulled all of his train stuff out, with which there were millions of boxes it seemed like, and all the things he built from scratch. Mostly, um, he built covered bridges and mountains and all these things from scratch. And in fact, when he was in kindergarten, he built the, uh, I was so embarrassed because um, at Thanksgiving of his um, <coughs> kindergarten year, my mother-in-law made us all go to Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't really want to take Will to Vegas, but I was like, if everyone's going, and I wanted to be with the family, so he built on a piece of plywood um, the Vegas Strip. For oh. <laughs> and he had the pyramid, and, the, and it was quite amazing, and I have a fabulous picture of it. It's really great. It's still, it's still in our house. But anyway, so he has all this stuff for trains. He's bringing all that back out again. So I think he's really interested in trains. He and his father take a cross-country train trip every single summer. They go through Canada or through <coughs> up, down. I mean, now I think they've almost made every Amtrak <coughs> leg there is. So it's all about trains and um, baseball. What do you see him doing in the future, like for college, like engineering? or? He doesn't seem to be that interested. And his, he has a, um, in terms of put, putting things and building things, I mean, it's so easy for him and he likes it so much. He wants to be uh, a veterinarian oh, yeah. more than anything. Yeah. That's what he wants. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, and he gives Buddy um, the dog we have now. Um, she has to take um, shots for her skin mm -hmm. allergy, so he gives her her shots every Monday. Cool. He's, he's very into that, and he bathes them all the time. They're really, really hairy. They're crazy hairy. So he bathes. He, so he takes good care of them. <coughs> the rabbits and everybody in my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys, you want me to sign some books for you? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'll go so out much. and then um, just uh, just come and get a book. Let's do Yay. it. Thanks, guys. Yay.